Excellent. All right, welcome and thanks for joining us for our last Artist Talks of the semester. Um, my name is Erica Quam. I'm the Interim Director here at Purdue Galleries. Uh, today we're joined by Roberta Lugo, whose work is currently on display in Ringel Gallery and Stewart Center. Um, just a few quick things before I properly introduce our guest. Um, we are recording, so I'll keep you all on mute um, for the duration of the talk. Uh, we'll be doing a Q&A at the end, so please enter any questions you have into the chat and then I'll read them out later. Um, and uh, we hope to have this session available on our exhibitions page later. So in case you have to miss part of it, it will be available and you can find us at purdue.edu slash galleries. Um, and I am so pleased to introduce our exhibiting artist, Roberto Lugo. Um, like I said, he's an artist and ceramicist as well as a social activist, spoken word poet, and educator. Um, he holds a BFA from the Kansas City Art Institute and an MFA from Penn State. Um, and he's currently an assistant professor at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture. Roberto, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So let's get into it, everybody. Let's see here. I'm just gonna share my desktop here. So um, I actually wanted to start off uh, this year um, I worked on a film uh, the last couple years uh, called Without Wax, and uh, this year got into a film festival, and um, so I wanted to go ahead and show an excerpt for that to start off the talk. About it, you know, like how to do. If I un if I'm you. Yeah, if you mute, we can't hear it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're always so confident. You believed in yourself. You could be anything. I felt that. Like I I'm sorry, everybody. I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty here. So, and then my dog screaming in the background. So I think everybody knows uh, this predicament I'm in. I wanted to be just like that, you know? Everywhere I went, people would recognize me as, as Lil Louie's brother, and I was so proud of that. It was the only thing I wanted to be. No matter what I do in life, I wish I could be you. Anything you would ever do, you'd be good at it, you know? And I think that's where I get all my inspiration from. You know, like I chose to be a potter, but you know, because of what you taught me, I feel like I, I could have chosen to be anything and have been good at it, you know? Cause I just like, I just fake like I'm you and do that thing like you would. I don't know why you proud of me for. I feel so fake all the time making pottery, like I'm gonna do something with it, you know? Like, what's making a pot gonna do for anybody in the hood? You know, like what's what's a pot gonna do to like prevent you from, you know, getting in the space that you would, you know? I don't think you needed to change. I think everybody else needed to change. I don't think pots are shit. I don't know, it's just what I know how to do, you know? And like, I feel as if it's just hustle. You know, like, being from Philly is, is just hustle. And it doesn't matter what you chose, what path you chose, because if I, if I, take, if I take that grind, that grind that you got for all the things that you've done, if I take that and I apply to anything, I'll be all right. They don't like it when you come up. They don't like it when you hustle. Because for people, it seems like in order to be successful, somebody else has got to fail, you know? I never see you knock anybody else down. You're just trying to have yours. Thank 
Myself and the people in this room can kill hate by allowing children from everywhere to have access to clay, by allowing them to get on the wheel and fail, then go home later that day and look at a mug and see how perfect it is and drink out of it and say, how does someone make this so perfect? And then look at the walls around them and say, someone made that that way. The floors, Sorry, everything everyone, around you changes when you're able to fail, when you have access to, to an education in the arts. So thanks for uh, bearing with me here. <laughs> a lot of technology stuff. You know, I should, should know how to do all this by now. I'm not sure for many of you, but I've been teaching online um, all this semester uh, and uh, twice a week for two classes. So um, well, anyway, my name is Roberto Lugo. And um, Erica, can you folks hear me okay right now? Great. All right. <laughs> Okay, awesome. So um, I want to, you know, introduce uh, myself a little bit. And, you know, one of the things that I found with uh, giving a lecture online is just, um, I think it really helps for me to be um, a bit less um, informal and just sort of like talk through what I'm showing um, and engage in that way, just because I feel like that's kind of in a place where we are right now. So if you, if you got a cup of coffee, we're just going to walk through what it is that I do. And um, so this first image is just one of um, uh, ALC, uh, and uh, I just love this close-up. I recently uh, put it on Instagram, and um, you know it's, it's partly representative of, of a direction that my work is going in this. Um, you know, thinking about um, how I've uh, historically combined uh, textiles and the history of the decorative arts with uh, hip hop and graffiti, um, and you know. I've, I've been working in this way so long that now I'm starting to develop this, this uh, opportunity to be able to um, create new textiles and create new designs and things that, that are really more um, wholeheartedly my own. So I wanna introduce you to my, my studio. Um, I started off as a graffiti artist um, around 16 years old in Philadelphia and I didn't really see it as an art form. I sort of just saw it as a way to interact with um, my cousins and people in the community. It was sort of like a social thing. Um, and part of what I do in my studio right now is I'll come in and I'll paint on the wall here um, a message and I'll use social media to broadcast that message. And then um, I'll cover it up. And then uh, when I feel inspired to make another message then I'll go ahead and, and write something else. Um, so, you know, this, this kind of reminds me of um, how when I was younger and I would paint graffiti, the, the, the city would cover up my paintings. Um, and it's sort of like back and forth every day with, you know, me painting and having that covered up, you know, really made me realize that what I was doing uh, was some sort of threat to um, the community that I was in because, you know, we, we had garbage all around. We had all these other issues. And from my perspective, I didn't think graffiti was the worst out of them. However, it was the thing that was covered up. And I think partially it was because the people who are doing it felt some sort of autonomy. And that autonomy was a fear um, that, that uh, you know, many others in the community had, people that were, were in control. Um, this is where I grew up. 
only a few blocks away I'm not from sure you. why this okay this is one of the things that's hard is uh okay so we're just going to look at it like this so this um middle building here um the the one that says ska on it that is a building that i um I grew, I grew up um, in, in my family would call it the cave and it was the cave because the back of this building um, had no windows and my father purchased this, this, this business with the idea, you know, that everybody has of the American dream. And, you know, the idea was that, you know, you'd have this business and you'd sell goods and the, the business already came with things in it, like um, this hodgepodge sort of eclectic mix of things like Berenstein Bear Records and um, watches with the calculators on them, Vicks Vapor Rub, and um, you know, but my father, because he wasn't really connected to the community that he was involved in, he didn't realize that you know this sort, this store of things didn't really make sense. It's not like somebody would go into the hood um, to purchase you know Vicks Vapor Rub and a Berenstein Bears record at a store. Like that's not a thing that people do. And so there was sort of this like separation from society and culture um, that he experienced uh, being a Puerto Rican and, and not really like understanding what he was seeing around him, not really having that cultural connection, being someone who was born and raised in Puerto Rico. And, um, you know, when I was going to school, uh, one of the, the books that I was recommended to read by um, a, a writer and a creative um, professor that I have was um, The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. And, uh, you know, one of the, the arguments or, or one of the things that, that is exposed in this book is how, you know, you as a person of color, in this particular case, a black person, could physically exist in a space um, every day, day in and day out. People can see you, they can hear you, but you're not actually participating. You're not welcome in it in the same way that other people are. And um, in, that, in that way, you are invisible. Um, and it's amazing how often we have these like moments in our adult lives where we get some clarity on uh, our childhood or on experiences that we've had. And um, this was a really eye-opening moment in that, like when I, when I felt that I, I, I immediately was able to connect it to my present experience, which was being an undergraduate student at the time, studying ceramics and um, exhausting every effort I could to um, participate and become part of that community. So, um, and still today, I'm, I'm quite a people pleaser. You know, I, I at the time I um, would make empanadas and have parties where I would invite people over and try to like get to know people and become friends. And um, I would make people things and and um, and try to like do what I thought you needed to do to uh, make and 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 have friends um, in college. And I realized that. You know, no matter what efforts um, that I made, I was still seen as different, and, and it was really diff difficult to to go beyond that barrier with my peers. And that was a real big turning point for me as an artist because, um, you know, up to that point, I really wanted to be a production potter. I fell in love with the idea of of making pottery, and you know, making it accessible. Um, and then um, that is a point where I started to realize that my face was. Um, was different and people were treating me different in school. Like everywhere I go, people would ask me for my ID. And even when I showed them the ID, they didn't believe I was a student there. And this is a pretty small school, it was only 600 people. Um, so, you know, those realizations are what leads me to make the work that I do as, a, um, as an artist and also as an educator. So I'll give you a few examples of that. Um, uh, in the clay studio here in Philadelphia, um, they, they bring a clay, um, two classrooms all over the city and they give uh, class people who um, don't normally have access to um, art in general. Um, they'll bring um, and they'll have an assignment and they'll teach the kids how to make things with clay. They'll bring them back to the clay studio and then they will bring them back to the children. So um, I got to be a guest teacher um, in, in, in one occasion and we actually went back to one of my uh, childhood classrooms and I saw a child um, in the corner uh, sculpting and the assignment that I made was sculpt a self portrait with three things you like about yourself. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I took the experience of being somebody who uh, my neighborhood growing up and the way that people communicated and spoke 
made me really insecure. And I took that and, and used that to create an assignment that I thought would um, in many ways be a response to that for, for the children that I was working with. So I see this kid and he's sculpted in and I go, um, hey, what you making? He goes, I'm sculpting, a, uh, I'm making a chef. And I see that, I say, well, you like to cook? He goes, yeah, I like to cook. And I go, Nassim, what do you like to cook? He goes, I don't have a signature dish yet. And uh, I just thought that was great. He, rem he reminded me a lot of myself, Nassim did. Um, there's many different sort of layers to my work. I mean, historically, what people may know me for is uh, painting people of color or underrepresented people that have uh, made an impact on culture and society and sort of uh, putting them in this place of prominence, uh, like on a historically sort of um, place that's, that's really only uh, set up for the aristocracy or people who are wealthy. At some point, porcelain was considered more expensive than gold. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's these moments that you have as an artist, like one where I was digging through the archives at the Walters Museum and I got to pick up pottery um, and they had these, these uh, teacups um, that the, the, the owner, the person who donated most of the work at the museum had collected. And there was a, an image of a serpent biting off its own tail. And um, I was trying to think about what, what connection I could make that to my, my life. Um, and like something, it, it just reminded me of something. And um, at the time, uh, Donald Trump was, uh, was going for office and um, he spoke of Frederick Douglass as if he was a, a person who was still alive. Um, and, you know, that, that, that made me realize that this was the, the, the place that I was, the, the, the image that I was thinking of. And so in this particular instance, um, I, I took that experience and I made a pot of a serpent biting off its own tail with a portrait of, of, of Donald Trump. And um, I don't often uh, do work that's overtly political. A lot of times I'm painting an, an image of someone, um, but you know, these, these last four years have really uh, changed a lot for artists um, and people in general where um, the, the conversation has been so, um, it's been so d divisive that you kind of feel like you can't sit back you, you sort of feel like you have to make work that's really direct and in response to it. This particular piece is at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. And then this museum was a, a piece was a commission I made for the New Orleans Museum of Art. And so I was asked to um, respond to and, and make a piece inspired by New Orleans. And so some of my work, you know, one of the things that I, I, I'm really doing is I'm also responding to it from the perspective of someone who grew up where I did. So being someone who grew up in Philadelphia in an urban neighborhood, mostly people of color, that also just happens to be a neighborhood that is very uh, impoverished. You know, my perspective of uh, like New Orleans is primarily based off of hip hop. Um, and so some of the things that you may know of, um, like for example, uh, Cajun food or what a po' boy is, or, you know, um, the sort of the other histories of New Orleans aren't things that are like in the conversation. We're thinking about things like, no Limit Soldiers or Little Wayne. And these are like the most uh, relevant to the community where I, I grew up at. And so I, I made a piece um, of Louis Armstrong, a, a tank from No Limit Soldiers, which is a hip hop sort of label and uh, this, this urn of Little Wayne. And then um, these are pieces, Erica, you have a question? Sorry, really quickly. Um, do you have slides of these? Because we're stuck on the Invisible Man one. Is that supposed to be? Oh, up? wow. Is that what's happening? Yeah, okay. sorry. <laughs> no, it's OK. I, I, so you're not seeing any of the updated slides. OK, sorry. All right. I'm going to stop share, and I'm going to share again. And then hopefully that will take care of that. All right, so there's that slide. Are you able to see anything now? Is it different now? OK, all right, good. I was talking about, I was just ex describing stuff to you. I'm glad that you brought it up. Um, okay, so that's the piece I was just talking about. Here's the, um, the work at the New Orleans Museum. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Uh, so here's uh, Louis Armstrong, and this is a tank for No Limit Soldiers. And then here's the, the infamous Lil Wayne, who's, um, who, you know what, I'll, I'll go into this, you know, so, um, So 
what I wanted to say was um, there's a, been a recent, you know, there's a lot going on in, in contemporary culture, especially if you're, you live in sort of the liberal side of things, where most of the people that I find on social media, most of the conversations that I have are definitely from a, a left perspective. But um, there's been sort of this like push to, to cancel Lil Wayne because um, he was supportive of, of Donald Trump. And, um, and, you know, one of the things that I find really interesting of, of that is that that is surprising to people, but not very surprising to me. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the story that I started off with, that video that I started off with, is um, a, a story of my brother uh, being in prison um, while I was in graduate school. And my brother is somebody who um, also is in support of Donald Trump. And, uh, you know, I watched the last debate with him when it was Hillary Clinton, and we, we watched the same debate. And at the end of it, he looked at me and said, man, Donald Trump killed it. And uh, I looked at him and I said, you know, I, I, I didn't uh, get any substance out of the conversation. Like, he was just sort of speaking in like really kind of plain terms, like, like I'm really greater, like I'm better than the generals. But it wasn't like, here's a plan, you know? And he, uh, my brother wasn't looking for that. Uh, and so it, it's this thing where, you know, um, regardless of you know this is why a lot of times when they, they talk about polls they talk about like education right and, and being in a secondary education and and having some of your um your ideas challenged right you know like it, it, where, where i come from you know often it's about this idea of stunting or showing off um like having really nice sneakers or having really big rims and you know donald trump is really symbolic of that you know this sort of like uh, of hip hop in some ways of the sort of like selfish uh, selfishness of it of the misogyny of the you know there's, there's a lot of aspects of hip hop that would would tie in to a Donald Trump but um you know for me hip hop um is really a music that derived uh from uh, you know a black in in um in, in brown culture in the United States and um, it's, it's far more complicated than, you know, just because somebody is, is involved in hip hop doesn't mean everybody thinks the same, right? And so um, I could look at someone like Lil Wayne and um, understand where that person is coming from, but, but yet not agree with, with their perspective because I see that in my own life. And I often have to find myself explaining to my brother, for example, why um, a lot of, uh, a, a, for example, um, a right wing, sort of perspective might, um, might have racist overtones to it, you know, and, and I have to sit there. And so he, he might not get that, but through this conversation, I'm gonna think a lot of times that that moves us in a certain direction. And just making sure, can you see this new image here? Okay, so these are images I posted recently on my, my Instagram, and this is for a commission that I have for a collector in Thailand. And he asked me to make these really large um, urns and with some of my newer work, historically, I've taken from uh, textiles from like a, a, a Chinese uh, porcelain and um, in African textiles uh, like Ghanaian. Um, and, you know, right now I'm also looking at figuring out ways to connect and uh, represent um, the, the creativity of the people that I am also uh, commemorating on the work. And so... Um, maybe a unicorn in, in Jimi Hendrix doesn't necessarily make sense to everyone, but I, I have a feeling that Jimmy would be okay with it. Um, this is Erica Badu um, on a teapot of mine. And, you know, one of the really interesting things that has happened is uh, with my work is as I've continued to develop it, um, I actually wind up uh, getting a connection with the people that I uh, put on my work. And so um, I, I was able to uh, send Erica uh, Badu a teapot through um, her uh, a family member who asked for one. And now we're like working on doing something together in terms of design and pottery. So I'm working with her directly um, on a project. And then um, these are, are pieces that I made um, maybe a, a few years after uh, Mike Brown was killed and you know, part of the, the, the idea with this was that I would, um, I would bring back into the conversation someone who fell out of the news. Um, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how to deal with it when, when these um, murders first happened, but then I thought about Clay's longevity 
and how it lasts for thousands of years and how people use clay to tell the story of cultures in the past and how um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the ways that we talk about things in the news or in social media goes in waves. It's almost like these people are forgotten after a while. And so I find that one of the functions and roles of clay is to be able to keep a conversation going um, long after it's, it's out of the sort of popular dialogue. Um, and, oh, and, and one of the things I forgot to mention is um, this, this particular piece, I got a, 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 an email from uh, someone and um, his name is Speech. And he, uh, he was a, a rapper for um, um, a band um, that I really loved called Arrested Development in, in the 90s. And they were actually, Arrested Development is uh, super influential on my work. Uh, I would say probably Arrested Development and the Wu-Tang Clan are, are like the two groups of people that really inspired me and, and probably the most relevant. And this person just wrote me and, and told me about how beautiful my work was. And this in, in particular sent me an image of this piece. And this is a, a person that I grew up listening to, um, his music. And um, because it was one of the few things that I was allowed to listen to in my family, because we were sort of like really uh, heavily Christian and, and religious, but um, Arrested Development would also talk about God and their their stuff. And so it, it like gave me a free pass to be able to listen to it. Um, but I just thought like, what a small world that this person that I listened to that inspired me to make the work that I do, then randomly wrote me an email telling me how much they appreciate my work. It just like, that was something that really blew my mind and I don't know if I'll ever quite get over it. Um, and then um, I also have a studio practice where I exhibit and, and, and sell things uh, to, through my gallery, to museums, to collectors, but then I also have an accessible line of my work, a, a pottery line where I'll throw hundreds of mugs and make them somewhat affordable. I have to cover my costs, um, but at, at the same time, these cups um, will sell usually, I'll sell them usually a range from 100 to $250, but um, people have been buying these and selling them on, on eBay and things like that for $600. Um, and so it's one of those things where um, I am, and I also have a, 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 a I also um, have a habit of using the money that I make from these cups to raise the money for a different organization. So whoever it is that I am, uh, commemorating that month. Um, like for example, next month, I'm going to be doing Stacey Abrams. So I'm going to be donating a portion of that money to, um, you know, uh, voting rights organizations and people that are working towards getting more people registered. And so um, every month I'm sort of operating in this way where I get to make my studio work and then I get to make functional work, which is then accessible to my community. Um, but then also like works towards this like larger cause. And for me, it's something that I find that's like really important to, for me to feel whole as an artist because, um, and that's probably one of the reasons why I paint and put other people on my pottery. I started by putting an image of myself, which I'm sure many of you have seen if you've gone to the gallery. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I've, I've always been uncomfortable with how, how much art is about uh, me as the artist you know, uh, like I'm giving a lecture and talking to you about my story. And, um, and I love being an educator because it's like for a time I can make it about somebody else, you know, and then also in my art, I can commemorate and make it about somebody else, you know, because yes, maybe some people are buying my cups because I made it, but I think also people are buying it because they really love Stacey Abrams, you know, and it's about her you know, and that work is about her. And, and it gives me the opportunity that me as an artist, I train to like learn how to make these pots. And then I could use that ability and that skill set to, to honor somebody who I think is, is really important. And so um, this particular piece that, you, that um, we have uh, at the, the galleries, um, this is actually a, a live casting of, of my body. Um, I was a little heavier at the time, maybe about 40 pounds heavier, but um, just to give you an idea of this process, I had to encase myself in um, each section of my body in rubber and plaster for hours at a time. So my, my lower half of my body, um, I had to uh, have people apply um, this rubber onto me to get every nook and cranny and then cover that in plaster. And that took five hours of me standing. 
um, and me like holding two sticks. And then after a while, um, the actual like blood in my legs, um, I couldn't feel my legs anymore when they took it off. So it, it took about a half hour of people shaking my legs and slapping my legs after I came out of it for me to feel that again. And uh, my head was two hours and my torso was three hours. And so um, this is one of those, those projects on his artists that you have to like really mean it, you know, when you're like going into it because it was, it was very intense. But the, the idea um, that I had was I've always felt like really like racially ambiguous. You know, I, I am Puerto Rican, but I'm also um, part African and I'm also, um, you know, Taino which is the indigenous people of Puerto Rico. And so I wanted to take my DNA um, and, you know, body into all the different, um, uh, all the different places that my blood comes from. And so this piece, the, the upper part of the, the sort of neck part of it is a Taino textile. And then the part underneath that is a, um, is a textile uh, from, uh, from Africa and then the lower part of my body is this Spanish uh, tile pattern and then the, the belly of it is a uh, yellow um, and black bandana pattern which is uh, really uh, prevalent in the Puerto Rican community in the, the Latin Kings gang. Um, and so all of these sections are sort of representative of how much of my body uh, comes from these places. And then the, the, the urn, the shape around it, um, I really uh, design this piece to to have my body fit um, right inside of it and um, you know one of the things that happens I think often with an urn like when I showed you that Mike Brown urn um, and, and the sort of the purpose of that too is you know we don't have images often on urn they're usually decorative and they sit in our living room um, or place of honor and it's sort of an opportunity to have that person with us and and but at the same time um, with some of these deaths I feel like it's not enough because it's important to be confronted with the life that's inside of it and realize that it's not just dirt or ashes. It's, it's a human being whose, whose life um, has ended. And so um, I thought that this would be a, a sort of um, a jarring way uh, to be able to connect um, the relationship between my, my body and the urn. I'm going to skip this and sort of, I want to talk a little bit about um, education and um, how I, sort of came to a lot of these ideas. So when I first started um, on the potter's wheel, it was very uncomfortable sort of seeing because I, I, I found myself in there because I, I wanted to go to college. I, I moved away from Philadelphia, Florida and the classes in community college were really reasonable there about $400 a class. And so <clears throat> I didn't want anybody to know where I come from and knew that I came from a really poor educational system. So I thought, you know, I'll start off in something more visual where I can, you know, get my feet wet and like engage with people. Um, so I, I, I took a drawing class and the teacher was a potter. And he said, try the potter's wheel. And I saw it as a machine that makes round things. I didn't see it as a machine that made pottery because I had no cultural relationship with pottery, you know? And the other students in the class, the, the white students that were from Florida, um, they were making teapots and cups. And I was just thinking to myself, like, how much tea are people drinking? And, you know, like I, I had a, all these questions and I sort of felt like it was a, 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 some sort of social experiment, me being there. And I felt like at any point, someone was gonna tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, what are you doing here? And like, your people are not supposed to be here. And um, it was just like an, in, this anxiety and in, in, in intense aspect of it that, I don't think everybody has. <laughs> there was a lot going on through my mind. And um, when I started making things on the wheel, um, I, I, one of the first things I made was this um, fire hydrant uh, soap dispenser. Because when um, my water gets shut off, uh, when I was a kid, my dad and I would shower in the fire hydrant. And it was kind of like funny to me, uh, you know, because looking back, uh, you know, I really liked that experience. I mean, being outside playing in water with your dad, you know, at midnight, um, there's a lot of fun, you know, but then we look back at it and we think, well, you know, that's because of the, the, the system you were raised in and that your, 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 your father and your, your parents were really set up to like live in poverty. So it's this like this dissonance that happens um, when I'm looking back at my life where there's like all these moments of pleasure, but also like 
I, I want to be a part of a world where um, I create opportunities for kids not to have to shower in fire hydrants or people to have access to water, um, you know, things like that. And so that's where I started off. And, and a lot of my work, you know, sort of developing became this thinking about where my past and my present sort of uh, interact. And so the way that um, a lot of sort of uh, the pottery I was looking at and the calligraphy and the line work uh, would be sort of these, these sweeping marks with a brush reminded me a lot of the way that I would tag with graffiti and then the way that a, a can of a spray paint runs if you overspray it reminded me of the way that a glaze runs if you overfire it. And I started to think about all these ways that there's parallels. And then started to include, um, you know, some of the things that I was currently inspired with, with the things that I grew up with, like the graffiti I grew up doing became sort of a, a pattern in textile that I go back to, um, to connect with the, um, the Asian uh, ceramics that I'm inspired by and then the European forms that I'm inspired by and um, how a lot of American education systems when it comes to um, education in the ceramic arts will often only get influence from um, Asian and European ceramics rather than African, South American, uh, Middle Eastern, um, you know, ceramics. And so um, I'm trying to, in my work, figure out a way to, to make a lot of these connections and, um, and, and make things visually connect. And so um, just a quick uh, example of where some of these patterns uh, can, can make a statement and also like make us confront some of our own biases. So when I was in graduate school, um, I would um, often throw pottery and I would uh, wear a bandana around my head. And um, it was because, excuse me one second, I'm trying to make sure my, my computer doesn't die. It was because I sweat a lot from my head. And so I would throw pottery and this bandana would catch it all. And then a couple of times I would go out into the, the, the school, the, the university, I was at Penn State. And, um, you know, one instance I was walking directly to some, towards someone and they, they were walking. We were the only two people in the, on the concrete and uh, on the, the sidewalk. And they, they winded up uh, walking across the street and walking on the other side. And, and I said, you know, um, I'm not really like a, that threatening of a person, you know, I'm like five foot six um, and, you know, I'm kind of pudgy and you know, I don't really understand why somebody would be afraid of me. And then I realized that I still had my bandana on and I was like, oh, they, it's possible that this person thought that in state college in on campus at Penn State that there was a, some sort of gangster walking around uh, because I had this bandana and it was a blue bandana. And I, I thought it was silly, but it, it also like made me again confront my appearance uh, uh, in my own mind. And then I walked back to my studio and I, maybe a couple of days later, I saw my friend Margaret um, wearing a, a, a different bandana, um, a red bandana. And uh, I'd always thought Margaret looked really cool, like wearing her bandana. And, uh, and I said to myself, it's so interesting how like someone sees me with a bandana and they think gang member and they see another person wearing a bandana in the same exact fashion and they think it's like a fashion, fashionable thing. Um, and so then I made a series of me wearing that bandana and then Margaret wearing um, the bandana on the other side and, um, and us being both pottery students. And you know, one of the things that winded up happening is you would see my image first and think gangster. And then you'd see this, this image of a white woman on the other side. And then you'd be sort of confused why she's on the same pot. And then you realize they're just, both people wearing the bandana. Um, through my art career, I, I've, I've moved quite a bit and moving back to Philadelphia, one of the things that um, I realized was some of the things that I had become accustomed to that weren't necessarily customary in other places. So one of the things being um, in Philadelphia, um, often when there's um, somebody who is uh, killed by gun violence, um, people will bring um, teddy bears and uh, pictures and commemorative elements um, to that spot where that person uh, was killed. And, um, and so uh, I started to photograph and start to draw those things because I, I just felt like it was such a shame that people wanted to pay homage to these people. And at the same time, you know, they were choosing 
um, and they had to do it in this way that was sort of ephemeral and wouldn't last forever, you know. And I thought about again that 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 idea of clay's permanence and how it's sort of a, a, an anthropologic device that's been used um, to to tell us about cultures in the past. And so I decided I'd start to make some of these things in clay. And so these particular pieces are life size, like the the urn of Tupac is about my height, and so you can see the the scale of this teddy bear. And the idea again was to like figure out this relationship between ceramics and the community I grew up in. And so I made these urns that are life size of uh, Tupac and Biggie, um, which are both um, famous rappers who, who were killed by gun violence. And uh, you know, one of the things that this piece sort of really uh, visually represents, I think what I, what I do with my artwork best um, which is, you know, I'm connecting with the community I grew up in who maybe doesn't have a relationship with pottery. Um, and two very recognizable figures within that community, like the notorious B.I.G. And, and, um, and Tupac. And so for a lot of people who see this work, um, that, that, that look at this work, people of color um, who come from places like I do, they'll often say, you know, oh, that's a Tupac and Biggie piece. That's really cool. And um, but they'll also like get some sense of that the patterns on these works also have some, you know, some, uh, some history to them and some connection to um, the, the conversation. And then other people um, often like will not recognize Tupac and Biggie, but they will recognize the Greek patterning on the work and they'll recognize the Chinese patterning on the work. And, you know, it becomes this really interesting uh, thing where my work is, is connecting with a really broad audience. And often I find people that are more into clay and more into more of the sort of ceramic history facet to my work um, in conversation with people that are more into the hip hop and sort of contemporary uh, dialogue that happens in my work, which isn't something that like normally happens. You know, you sort of like are, are picking one audience. And what I'm doing is I'm really thinking about like this opportunity that I have as an artist to bring people who wouldn't normally be involved in a conversation together and engage with one another. Um, and so that's, that's some, something that I'm interested in. I'm just gonna show you a few um, images of some of my work installed. And so this is a piece of uh, Mike Brown um, that was installed and um, it has a, a figure of myself looking at it. And, and uh, to make this, this, this piece, I actually traced out my body. And so if you look at the, the actual shape of the urn, it's a, a silhouette of, of my actual form. So, you know, um, one of the things I would say uh, with, with my artwork and especially the, the, the objects and, and the theme of the things that I have um, in the gallery um, right now is, is, you know, I am constantly, um, evaluating uh, my identity because uh, I have felt um, for some time in my life really lost uh, and separated and not really welcomed into any community per se. I would say um, probably the, the, the black community is the closest thing that I've had to feeling like I, I have a family. And being involved in ceramics has definitely offered me that sense of community feeling like anywhere I go, I have somebody I can call that I know that lives in, in Atlanta that makes pots that I can engage with. Um, but some of the work that I have in there is this exploration of, um, of being Puerto Rican and uh, being part African. And, uh, you know, there's, a, um, and, uh, and that's really important to me and something that I feel like I'm probably going to be investigating for the rest of my life. Um, and, I got into a conversation yesterday with, with my wife and, uh, you know, one of the things I asked her, I said, you know, I don't really understand. Um, <laughs> I don't really understand why people like my work, you know, like I, I get it, but it's sort of like rough and it, it, it like has, has a lot of character to it, you know, but like everything that I can do, um, I find that there's somebody else who can do that one thing better. And so I just don't know why me, you know? And uh, she's good about like not trying to resolve things for me or, or give me answers. She just sort of listened. Um, but a, a lot of times I, I remember to, to think of and take my own advice. And 
um, one of the, the things that I tell my students um, often is, is you don't have to be the greatest at anything. Um, you know, for me, what makes an artist distinct is the combination of things that you are mediocre at. Um, and those things, you don't have to be the greatest at one thing. But like, for example, I make pottery and I also um, write hip hop. And uh, I'm also a professor and I also come from a neighborhood where most people who, who make pottery don't come from. And so all these little things uh, make me distinct and unique. And I think that's true for a lot of artists. I, I think it's important to explore all the ways that you are different um, because um, for me, that's where I, I, I find Um, so I think that maybe what, I, what I'll do is end my talk with um, a, a, a short poem and it's um, 10 things um, to know uh, as an artist. Uh, and so um, I'm going to share that with you. So number 10, watch how you make your ends. You see cash could buy Benz, but it can't buy friends. And non, look, keep your ambition in line because if you're always looking forward, you can't buy back time and eight. Man, you might have to see some hate. A lot of things that you make, nobody relates. And seven, watch out for dudes named Kevin. They come in different names and offer you big fame. If you trust in the wrong people, that brings you big pain. And six, look, you might have to take some licks, but there's a limit to that, man. Don't take no shit. And five, man, nobody's more important than your wife. Ignoring loved ones brings you big strife. And four, this rule you can't ignore. Believe in yourself. Of this I'm sure. And three, look, this rule has got to be key. Being bitter is expensive. Being kind is free. And two, man, just forget everything you knew. Because all you know it all is you learn nothing new. You see people try to rank you. Believe this, my friend. It doesn't matter how long it takes for you to get to the end. Because if you meet, keep scoring a one, people are going to see you're a 10. In the end. Thank you guys for having me. And uh, I think Erica, if it's okay, we can open it up to questions and, and I don't know how much time we have. That sounds perfect. Um, yeah, if, we, uh, if you have any questions, um, go ahead and type them in chat or if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask them, that's totally fine as well. I already had my one big question answered, which was how on earth did you make that piece? Um, so thank you. Which one? The, the giant man. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I have a video of me uh, get, getting covered in, in a purple rubber. Um, and I usually don't show it because it's like, I don't want anybody to see me without a shirt. <laughs> I, I'm fairly sure I speak for a lot of people when I say I don't think that my anxiety could handle being covered in rubber for several hours. Yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. And also um, to do that, it took eight people because um, two people have to constantly be mixing the rubber that you use. And then eight separate people covering you and stuff is a lot. Yeah. Oh, wow. That would have been, yeah, quite the dedication um, to get that. Any questions from anybody that's not me? Um, I think Rob may have frozen as well. Stuck. There you go. I see you again. Okay, there you go. I see. All right. Um, Beautiful faces. Yeah. Gail would like to say that she's grateful that you found a way to share your life experience through art. Yes, I'm grateful too. Any questions, comments, anything? Otherwise, we'll close it out. I'll allow for quick typing. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Yeah, it sounds like that's about it. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your work. And we just so appreciate it. Um, Rob's work is on display in Ringle Gallery and Stewart Center through um, tomorrow, Friday. Uh, November 20th, 2020.
at 6 p.m. So if you can make it, um, that would be fantastic. Um, if not, thank you for joining us today and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks.